On this channel, I'm supposed to talk about books, but I owe a big part of this channel's growth to the Twilight fans on here, and even in my writing videos, I've discussed vampires in a video detailing exactly how authors should approach writing the mythical creature. Moreover, this is also a fantasy-themed channel, and so I do want to cover the odd supernatural topic. And what could be better than vampires? Out of all the paranormal beings there are, none hold the same fascination as the vampire. Seductive, dangerous, and charming, vampires have terrified and enthralled us for centuries. Initially reviled as monsters people genuinely believed in, they have gone on to become everything from sexy bad boys to LGBTQ icons. From Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles to The Twilight Saga to the works of Charlene Harris and L.J. Smith, vampires have left their bite mark on literature. Even now, the vampire continues to reign supreme. While they're not trending like they were in the early 2000s, vampires never stopped being popular, as evidenced by the many books which continue to be written about them. As such, I'd be remiss not to discuss the supernatural fiends on a channel dedicated to fantasy books and Twilight itself. Just recently, a novel which takes place in the world of Buffy the Vampire Slayer was released, to say nothing of the dozens of Buffy novelizations which have come before, and current vampire fans have been losing themselves in the work of Jay Kristoff. Also, it's spooky season. And in this video, I'll be dissecting exactly why vampires appeal to us so much. From their looks to universal attributes all vampires seem to have, there are at least five reasons vampires have an immortal hold on our pop culture. Before we continue, I'm Riley and this is Otherworldly Fiction. On this channel, I rant about fantasy books, discuss characters and lore, offer my bookish opinion, and share the occasional writing advice. If any of that sounds like your cup of blood, hit that subscribe button. Posts are on Fridays. Vampires have endured, as immortal in our imaginations as they are on the page and screen. And while there are dozens of essays and documentaries analyzing why the creatures have remained so beloved, here are the five reasons I believe vampires have flourished. Reason number one, immortality. One of the most notable traits of vampires is their ability to live forever. Despite all the differences between vampires across TV shows and books, they all have this in common. They will never die unless killed, and they are difficult to defeat. Beginning with Dracula, vampires have always had the ability to live indefinitely. Though permanent good looks or an ageless appearance aren't always a part of the bargain. In Dracula's case, the infamous Count had to feed to retain his youthful appearance. As such, when he was thirsty, he would have the appearance of an old man, even if aging itself couldn't kill him. In Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles, vampires face a similar dilemma. Though beautiful most of the time, they can become hideous if starved or exposed to sunlight, though ancient vampires have some immunity. Even the vampires of Twilight are affected if they do not feed. They remain young and attractive, but their eyes grow dark, and they become grouchy when they haven't fed. Yet all of these vampires, for all their differences, will never die, at least not as the result of old age. Even in books which don't feature vampires, immortality is an immortal idea. Readers never get sick of it, and there's a lure there. After all, many of us would love to live forever. Death is a big unknown, making it scary, and none of us can wrap our heads around not existing or never thinking again. It's just not something we can comprehend. Moreover, many of us would like to see the future and our bucket lists are ever-growing. I wish I could live forever, if only so I could read every book on my TBR pile. 
Name a fantasy series that doesn't feature immortality in some form. Oh, you thought this would be easy. Tolkien has his immortal elves, as well as Sauron and the wizards. Harry Potter features multiple characters who achieve immortality, albeit temporarily. The Grishaverse has the Darkling, who has used his magic to prolong his youth for centuries. Throne of Glass has Fae, who can live for thousands of years. Caravel has characters who act very much like vampires. And in Percy Jackson, Percy even turns down the gift of immortality when it is offered to him. The fact is, I can't think of a single series that doesn't feature an immortal being, or reference immortality in some form. And for that reason alone, vampires remain a part of popular canon. Immortality is a trope that will remain trending for centuries to come, at least until scientists find a cure for old age. And vampires are the perfect vehicle to explore this idea. Number 2. Wealth While not as exciting as immortality, wealth, like never aging or dying, still represents the unattainable. While great riches aren't impossible, being something people experience every day, it's something most of us will never have. For the majority of people, having an excess of cash is a dream as fantastical as never dying. Most of us would be happy just to be free of mortgages. As with immortality, wealth applies to most vampires. There are exceptions. Some vampires, particularly modern ones, might hunker down in a stylish crypt, but they aren't rich by any stretch. In Twilight, the majority of vampires are nomads. Going from place to place, they don't own anything. That said, Twilight's main vampires, the Collins, follow the trope of the rich vampire. Most vampires are rich because they're vampires. Their supernatural abilities give them advantages humans don't have. They can invest in long-term savings accounts, steal expensive trinkets from their victims, or simply amass wealth over time, as, being solitary creatures, they can minimize their spending. In Dracula's story, he was a count, and so he inherited his wealth, but Bram Stoker started this trope when he penned his magnum opus. Before Dracula, vampires were gaunt creatures who lived in graves and shuffled about in rags. Since Dracula and Carmilla, though, vampires have been rich. Even as stories moved away from nobles in giant castles, vampires still had plenty of money. In the Vampire Chronicles, there are still poor vampires, but those who do have money are fabulously rich. Lestat restores the castle he lived in with his family while human. Armand actually owns an island, and none of the vampires in Lestat's circle want for cash. Most have multiple places which they can travel between. In Twilight, it's the same. The Collins own dozens of homes, which they move between in order to avoid scrutiny. And Carlisle, again, owns an island, Isle Esme. Edward is always offering to buy Bella cars and houses, and for the average reader, that's as much a fantasy as the idea of never dying. Both feed into the other, too. No one wants to be immortal and poor, forced to shuffle about for eternity. And wealth is that much more attractive when you can enjoy the privileges it affords for centuries to come. Number 3. Beauty As with wealth, some have it and some don't. While wealth can technically be earned by anyone, beauty isn't something you can gain through hard work. It's something you're born with, and nothing can replace one's natural beauty. Granted, there is makeup, clothing, and surgeries which can improve a person's looks. But those who are naturally beautiful always stand out, and surgery is imperfect it still hasn't managed to replace what people are born with. Traditionally, the modern vampire is attractive. They might be chiseled and large, slender and pretty, or gaunt and brooding, but they always have some form of beauty. 
Even in Anne Rice's books, where vampires come in all races, shapes, sizes, and ages, everyone is attractive, and it's noted that vampires rarely change anyone who isn't beautiful in some way. The Chronicles mention that Magnus is one of the few ugly vampires in the series, but the story makes a point of it. Seizing immortality for himself, he wasn't chosen. Vampires might be delicate dolls with bouncy curls. They might be statuesque beauties with icy eyes. They might be all warm smiles and round blushing cheeks. And they might be pretty and sensitive, but all are enjoyable to look at in some form. In Twilight, vampires are likewise attractive. Even if they weren't astoundingly beautiful while human, the venom works to make their features pop. Their faces are more symmetrical. Their skin is smooth and unmarked. Their voices are gentle, with a ring to them. And even their scents, almost floral, are designed to draw others in. As with wealth, vampires weren't always beautiful. Even Dracula lost his good looks, taking on the appearance of an old man if he didn't feed. And in earlier centuries, they were essentially zombies, no more than animated corpses still dressed in the clothes they died in. Since Carmilla and Dracula introduced an element of seduction to the creature though, the idea of the attractive vampire hasn't gone away. Number 4. The Forbidden If the last three points on this list focus on the very unattainability vampires represent, this point focuses on the forbidden, that which we could attain, but which we shouldn't, whether because of the terrible acts they commit, or because of how they defy societal norms. We shouldn't want to be vampires, yet this is exactly why we want to be vampires. Because they are rule breakers, and in all of us there's a rebel. Vampires challenge the status quo. They allow us to imagine the forbidden, whether that's something genuinely bad or simply something a dated society has outlawed. Early vampire stories give power to the marginalized. Carmilla flirts with the idea of same-sex bonds in an era when gay relationships weren't allowed. Some readers find the book regressive now, but it's important to note that, in the time it was written, Authors had no other outlet to explore such ideas. The idea of sex and of relationships outside marriage was also frowned upon. Even among married couples, it was something you didn't talk about. Like using the washroom, it was kept behind closed doors and treated as a necessary evil to create children. Dracula, though, forced people to confront sex, and everything that comes with it. Dracula seduces multiple women, and with each victim he claims, he expands his harem. All are beautiful women, destined to be young forever, and each acts as a wife, following Dracula through eternity. The idea of not only a vampire, but one who had multiple partners, would have been horrifying to the Victorians, but they devoured the story all the same, because it went to all the places they couldn't, even in conversation. Until quite recently, people in the LGBTQ community weren't afforded the same rights, and even now those rights are under fire. Gay marriage hasn't even been legal for a decade, but through the last century, Anne Rice normalized the idea of sensuous relationships between all genders. In the Vampire Chronicles, vampires can't have literal sex, yet their feeding acts as a metaphor and is described as a similarly intense act. Even with their victims, vampires feel a deep passion. They desire their victims, and until they die, they covet them. When a vampire changes another, they do so because they adore the person and love how they look. More often than not, vampires take victims or create others from members of the same sex. And in reading Lestat's books, there are multiple mentions of how much he loves someone. 
and how he admires their beauty. Between Lestat and David, and Armand and Daniel, their attraction is even more blatant, with vampires holding each other and trading kisses, to say nothing of what their exchange of blood signifies. Same-sex relationships shouldn't be forbidden, but in a time when they were, vampire stories were a way for people to explore the sides of themselves society had repressed and Anne Rice's stories became something for the gay community to rally around. Of course, vampires represent the forbidden in other areas. Most obviously, they are killers. Murder is illegal and generally frowned upon. And yet, we continue to love the likes of Edward and Lestat, their body counts notwithstanding, because we love the bad boy. We love danger and we love what we can't or shouldn't have. Vampires are also known for being damned. If they are killed, they'll be sent to hell or cease to exist because they don't have souls, which are supposed to represent one's humanity. Yet even vampires who are literally soulless in their respective stories, like Buffy Spike, intrigue us because they represent forbidden or repressed desires. When you become a vampire, you make a deal with the devil himself. In order to be beautiful and powerful forever, you trade away your soul. And what could be more forbidden than that? Spike doesn't have a soul, and he represents everything Buffy fights against. And yet she falls for him, because even she, a vampire slayer, isn't immune to the allure of the forbidden. Reason number five engaging anti-heroes. Most characters who engage in forbidden or unconventional acts become what we now like to call anti-heroes. And in a world of increasingly tidy narratives and clean stories, anti-heroes continue to enchant people. From the bad boy you know the heroine shouldn't be kissing, to the jaded assassin with a heart of gold, anti-heroes are flourishing in literature. We can't get enough of them. There are still lines characters shouldn't cross if they want to avoid becoming outright villains. And some of those lines have moved over the past few decades. But anti-heroes continue to push those. Characters like Aelin, Legend, and Cardin aren't necessarily people we'd want to meet in real life. But we love reading about them. Vampires, of course, are the consummate anti-heroes. Even when they're the noted villains of the story, like Dracula, we find ourselves rooting for them. But Anne Rice reinvented the genre when she centered vampires as the protagonists. They were still vampires, they still did wicked things, and they all killed people. But they had humanity. Though murderers, they also felt deeply and were passionate about life. Flawed but engaging, her vampires were the perfect anti-heroes, and they pushed the boundaries as far as they could go. All of Rice's characters are fascinating. They also commit truly reprehensible acts, even beyond murder, and yet they have enough redeeming qualities, such as their deep love for each other and charm, to assure we love them regardless. In today's age, it would be only too easy to make Dracula and Carmilla the heroes of their respective stories, to understand and sympathize with them, even as they commit the worst of acts. Simply for introducing us to the idea of the anti-hero and for boosting what is now a flourishing trend, vampires can't be discounted. Murder is unacceptable in real life. But when it's committed by a funny, beautiful, supernatural being who loves his fellows deeply, it's hard to hurt the perpetrator, even if we despise the act. So, where does all this leave us? While vampires haven't gone anywhere, other fantastical beings have fought for the spotlight. After Twilight, we went through a zombie phase, and Fourth Wing may usher in a dragon craze. But the trend of the decade is that of the Fae. Now, this current obsession with fairies or the Fae is interesting, 
because an immortal by any other name is just as sweet. While you might be sick of girls losing their heads over Cardin or Cassian, it's intriguing because we're really just falling in love with the same ideas all over again. Though the Fae have currently replaced the vampire as the supreme being, the two are extremely similar. Everything I have listed, which has made vampires so popular, can be applied to the Fae. The most obvious similarities are their immortality and beauty. With flawless skin and dangerous smiles, the modern fairy even looks like a vampire. And I've seen instances where fairies or other immortal beings, like the Fates from Caravel, will drink blood. Fairies also exist outside human norms. They can be fated mates. Same-sex relationships are normalized between them. They lie and cheat and cross lines humans wouldn't dare to. They're charming and often wealthy to boot, with lavish palaces and courts. And like the vampire, they're a sex symbol. They're everything we want and can't have. They're immortal, rich, beautiful, and deadly. And that's why we love them. All this to say that, while vampires might have taken the back seat, the reasons they endure haven't. Which is exactly why they'll keep coming back. In conclusion, from immortality to a penchant for the forbidden, vampires continue to enthrall us. Even as vampires are superseded by creatures like fairies or fates, their qualities are embodied in these competitors. The same ideas continue to capture us. Immortality, wealth, beauty, and the forbidden. Vampires have always been a mixture of all of these ideas, and for that reason we will always love them. Along with beings who, while going by other names, essentially act like them. The idea of immortality is especially enduring. Despite wanting to be open-minded to all people, we can't help appreciating natural or supernatural beauty. And many of us continue to fantasize about great wealth, which for most of us will be as unattainable as immortality itself. Whether you call them vampires or fairies, characters which embody these ideas will continue to thrive. Literal vampires have also never disappeared. And every decade features a new vampire story which seizes the imagination of viewers or readers. The fascination with vampires isn't going anywhere for readers, which means the appeal for writers will remain as well. While you might understand why vampires are fascinating, actually approaching how to write them is another story. From their weaknesses, to the origins of how they came to be, to the relationship with other supernatural beings, there's a lot to unpack when it comes to writing the monsters. That's why I've created a guide to writing vampires and other paranormal peoples. In it, I list the questions you should ask yourself when designing your unique take on the monster. It's still Preptober, and with NaNoWriMo coming up, there's no better time to write that vampire novel. So click the video on the left for your how-to on vampires. And if you want to learn more about how the vampires in Twilight work, click my most popular video on the right. As always, thanks for watching and happy biting.